God is good. All the time. All the time. That's it. I have quite a few uh, announcements for this morning, so pay close attention because I can only say them once. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of our Lenten time. It is a time when we begin to prepare for Easter and the death and resurrection of our Savior. It is a time that we are reminded by the distribution of ashes that we are dust and to dust we will return. The service is at 7 o'clock here, as are all future Lenten services this year. All services will be here at Grove Court. The midweek services start at 7 and last about 30 to 35 uh, minutes. Uh, we look forward to having you join us. The men have put into your bulletins this morning a survey for the, uh, whether you want to participate or not participate in Lenten suppers being served prior to the midweek Lenten services. So please respond either yes or no, but be honest with your answers. And there is a basket in the back that you may put those um, tallies in. The um, Easter lilies, not exactly my favorites because I can't breathe, but the Easter lilies need to be, forms need to be completed and turned back in by the uh, 17th. So be sure to look at that and decide what Easter lilies you and your family would like to have. The um, <clears throat> ladies' um, dinner this month will be on March the 19th, not the 12th as, as originally planned, but on the 19th, and they are going to the Mackenzie River Grill at Polaris Parkway. So if any of you ladies that would like to attend, please sign up in the back. There's a, a sheet there to do that. The um, last that I have is, Next Sunday is daylight savings time. So if you don't change your clocks and you come at the normal time, you will have missed us. We will be finished or just finishing up. So move your clocks ahead. I'm sorry you lose an hour's sleep. That doesn't mean you can come and sleep during the sermon, right? Right. He stands when he say. And uh, so the uh, um, so move your clocks ahead and don't come at your normal 11 o'clock. Mike, you have something? Yeah, just a uh, reminder with the daylight savings time for next week in our council meeting. So anybody on the council, please remember to be here for next week. We've got a lot of business to take care of. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, concludes my announcements. I do welcome any and all visitors that might be with us this morning. Be sure and sign in the uh, registry book in the back. Um, and uh, then um, pay close attention to all those announcements that I gave you, quite a few, quite a few of them this morning. Uh, but now let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude and have the lighting of the candles.
Everybody please stand with me as we continue our worship of three quarter of confession and the good time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and heal us, so that we may abide in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with the opening hymn. <laughs> Church of God and for the unity of all who 
The first reading is from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read the song responsible. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. The Lord is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great and mighty, the high of all angels. Let them confess God's name, which is great and awesome. God is the Holy One. O Almighty King, the Lord of Justice, you have established everything. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. The Lord is great. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord and fall down before God's footstool. God is the Holy One. You spoke to them out of the pillar of a uh, pillar of cloud. They kept your testimonies and the decree decree that you gave them. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord and worship upon God's holy hill, for the Lord our God is the Holy One. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Since then, we have such a hope. We act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning, or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we command our, commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Now about eight days after these things, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And in those days they told no one any of these things that they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Perhaps one of the most oft-quoted proverbs in our time is Proverbs 29, the first half of the 18th verse. Without vision, the people perish. I've heard versions of this proverb in secular sources from many different places, places you would expect it, and even in church periodicals. The point of the proverb was understood to be where there is no clear vision of the future cast, the people, the congregation, the corporation, the nation, whoever the entity they're talking about, will drift aimlessly and cease to have a defined purpose and reason for existence. It's an interesting interpretation and one that might be valid in so many different ways, but it is not the point of Proverbs 29:18. The true force of the text is the understanding without revelation that is, without God revealing himself, and hence God's purpose and will, the people perish. Why? Because no one possesses the power to discern God and God's purpose on their own. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, not scientist or seeker, nor the intelligentsia, nor the humble part. No one, no one can uh, discern God's person and will apart from God revealing himself. It is impossible. Now, through the two testaments of Scripture, that is, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant, the New Testament, God has chosen, God himself has chosen to reveal himself to this very day. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God revealed himself through things like dreams, visions, and physical manifestations of his presence. Two points here. First, in Luke's Gospel, whenever Luke talks about Jesus going to pray, he always goes up some, to some high place to pray. Second, the Jewish people believe that when the Messiah, the anointed one of God, came, it would be the eighth day of creation. Or another way of looking at it, it would be the first day of the new creation when the Messiah came to restore all things. That's one reason in baptism we talk about it being the eighth day. 
It's the first day of a new creation for somebody being born of water, being born of the Spirit, born from above, in and through Jesus Christ and the Jesus the Holy Spirit. I don't know if Luke is alluding to this belief by calling our attention to the timetable just prior to the transfiguration or not. It seems like he put it in there for a reason. Luke mentions it was about eight days before Jesus went up on the mountain to pray that Jesus asked his disciples, this is a text just prior to ours, we didn't have today, but he asked the, the, the disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? Remember that whole thing? And they reply, some say that you are John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist had been killed by Herod Antipas, beheaded by him, and so they, what they're thinking is Jesus is John resurrected. Others say Elijah. Well, Elijah was a prophet who the Jews believed would be the herald and forerunner of the Messiah. So some people think Jesus is not the Messiah. He's the Elijah figure to herald whoever is to come next. And still others, one of the prophets from long ago, who has come back to life. That was prophesied in the Old Testament. would happen before the end, before in the, in the last days. People would rise from the dead from their tombs, and you would see them, and they would be back to prophesying. So they thought, well, maybe it's the end time. And then Jesus is one of the prophets resurrected to share what God is about to do in these end times. Then Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? To which Peter answered, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Following Peter's profession, Jesus shared with the disciples, who I, Jesus, say that I am. And he said to his disciples, the Son of Man, referring to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. So, we are privy to who the crowd believes Jesus is, whom the disciples believe Jesus is, and finally who Jesus says he is. A little over a week following this conversation with his disciples, Luke records Jesus took Peter and John and James, that's the inner three, Right? Jesus has 12 disciples. I mean, there are many, many more, but 12 that he chose to follow him. And out of the 12, there are three who are the inner three, the inner troika. And then out of the inner three, Jesus even pours more time and effort on one, who would be Peter. So he takes the inner three up the mountain to pray. Now, why would Jesus take three people with him? Remember in the Old Testament, if you wanted to have a witness in the court of law, it took two or three witnesses, right? Even in the New Testament, in Matthew 18, Jesus says, you know, if, if somebody has law against you in the church or something's going on, you go privately to them, you, you talk to them, and if, if everything's worked out, you're being your brother or sister, everything's good, if you won't listen, take a couple of people with you. Why? To substantiate what you're talking about. Well, Jesus takes Peter, John, and James with him up the mountain because he has three witnesses now about what is it that's going to take place. And after he's crucified, after his resurrection and ascension, the disciples then, these three, will give witness to what happened on the mountain. They're talking about all sorts of things. And they're going to say something like, well, you know, if we didn't talk, we were terrified. We didn't talk about it, you know, when we came down from the mountain. But while we were there, this happened. And Jesus actually talked to Moses and Elijah. I don't know where they had name tags so I always wonder, how can you know Moses and Elijah? I guess it had to be that when you see Moses and Elijah, you just intuitively know that's who it is. I don't know. But they knew. And what did they talk about? Jesus' exodus, his departure, his crucifixion in Jerusalem. What does that mean? It wasn't a fluke. He wasn't crucified because he couldn't get out of it. Because he was foolish and stayed in Jerusalem. He should have stayed over at Bethany across the, across the river where he'd been saved. But he came back. He shouldn't have come to Passover. You know, it wasn't that he had to do it. It was God's purpose and will for Jesus to die. For our sins. To pay the blood price for us. You know, to, to redeem us. And not only us, but all of creation becomes redeemed in Jesus. So it was prophesied clear back in the third chapter of Genesis. During the fall, when it was said that, that the Lord would crush Satan's heel, but also that Satan would bite the Messiah's heel. 
He did in crucifixion. But in resurrection, Jesus crushed sin, death, and the devil under his heel. So they would remember these things. So he took all three of them so they could testify and witness to what was about to take place in Jesus' life. Grab me now. He was a former professor of Trinity Lutheran Seminary. He no longer exists as a seminary. He's also a classmate of mine. He said about Peter, he said that Peter is hardly the example of a non-anxious presence. As Peter starts stammering about at the end of it, when they're about to leave, uh, Moses and Elijah are about to leave Jesus, he starts stammering about building booths. We're told that he doesn't know what he's talking about, and we're told that while Peter stammered on, consumed by his anxiety, desperate to control that which he cannot comprehend in that moment, God is acting purposefully from the midst of his Shekinah glory. Peter is talking, but it's God who has something to say. Peter is enthralled with the light of God's glory, but God is balancing light with the coming darkness that lay ahead. In cloud, glory, and all, the scene is reminiscent of Mount Sinai, where Moses and Elijah now join Jesus in discussing his exodus, which, will, as I said, will soon take place in Jerusalem. God indeed enveloped the three disciples in the cloud of his glory. And they heard God's word concerning Jesus. This is my son, whom I have chosen. What did God say? Listen. Listen to him. <coughs> when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they saw Jesus only. Think of that. They saw Jesus only. There's a crucial reason they are present, as I said, to give witness to what's about to take place. And so that seeing Jesus only means that Jesus, you see, is the authoritative teacher for his disciples and for all the human family. Jesus has God the Father's imprimatur on him. He is God. He's a part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when He speaks, He speaks for the Father and the Spirit. And through the Spirit, our Spirit witnesses when we hear God's Word that it's meant for us and we belong to Him in baptism and by God's grace and through Jesus' death and resurrection. We are part of the family. We are witness to that reality. And that Jesus is the one we are to listen to. Not the Word. Not what I might think. Not what anybody in the church might say. Jesus is the definitive teacher for us. Well, so as 21st century disciples, we encounter Jesus' true identity in the transfiguration. And in the encounter, we are prepared then to move in liturgical fashion from the season of epiphany, the season of light, to a day of ashes on Ash Wednesday and into a season of shadows in Lent. And again, as Dr. Beenow put it, he said, allow yourself to be overshadowed and to be open to the possibility that the shadow overtaking Peter, James, and John and all the rest of us, this dazzling darkness, he calls it, of the cloud is in fact the shadow of the cross. <laughs> For to pay attention to the voice that speaks from the darkness. And when God the Father says, listen to Jesus, let us do just that. Hear what Jesus told the disciples about eight days before his transfiguration. The darkness of the cross is not an inconvenience. It was an absolute necessity. A part of God's plan for redeeming the human race from before time began. Jesus will not be known apart from the cross. Jesus cannot save us without the cross. And he will not have us look for our salvation anywhere other than the cross. T.S. Eliot wrote, I said to my soul, be still, and let the dark come upon you, which shall be the darkness of God. T.S. Eliot's words are a modern echo of what John of the Cross in the 16th century described as the dark night of the soul. It can seem like nothingness. It feels like emptiness, like time without purpose or direction or meaning. A time when what was once available, so accessible, so imminent, 
is now hidden. We're like the cloud that overshadowed the transfiguration. This kind of darkness, this living in the shadow of the cross, is gift. It was a gift for the disciples to be on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was a gift that the Father spoke as He had spoken and led them in the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire by night led them, those who came out of the answers. It was a gift. And this was a gift to them, to us. It is a gift that nurtures growth. It's a gift that deepens mystery. And it is a gift that brings healing healing to our souls, to the very deepest part of our human longing, hope, desire, and need for God to be a part of our life. It is gift because you know it. The world needs that. The gift of God's presence in their life. But they don't know it. They go after everything else in the world to try to fill up their life. And nothing fills it. And yet they will not repent. And yet they will not come. But the gift is yours. And you know it. That God fills up your soul and spirit with His own dear presence. It is life. It's living water that wells up out of you and over, overflows your heart and being. And then it splashes on other people as you go about your life. So that by God's grace, you too are a blessing of God's presence in other people's existence, in other people's lives. And whether they know it or not, the water of the living Christ and the Spirit is splashed upon you. And God uses you in this, as an aspergus. You know what an aspergus is? That's a, like a, a bough of, of, of uh, old pine or something that you'll see priests sometimes or others. They dip in the holy water, you know, the water of our baptism, and they whoosh it out over the, over the congregation. The Spurgis is that little branch they dip in the living water. But God uses you as an Spurgis to bless and to sprinkle His water, His love, His mercy and grace over all those with whom you move and live and have your being. Because not only does God love you, we remember that God loves them very much even though they will not acknowledge Him. He still loves them. He still sends you to be that touch of God's grace in their life.
like in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. From the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us draw near to the light of Christ, offering prayer and supplications on behalf of the Church, the world, and one another. Father, today we kneel in awe and adoration before the divine majesty, your Son, revealed at his transfiguration. But sometimes our devotion grows cold, our prayers and worship become perfunctory, or our attitude toward Jesus becomes, he's my best buddy, he's there for me if I need him. Enlighten our minds to always catch a glimpse of this glorious presence and kindle our hearts and spirits to worship and obey him with holy fear, deep joy, and fervent love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God, beyond all praising, we worship you and adore your glory, revealed in the transfiguration of your beloved Son. Grant that your church may obediently listen to his word, hold fast to him in its heavenly calling, preach him alone as the way of salvation, and thus proclaim to the whole world his blessings without number and his mercy without end. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant to your persecuted people a firm confidence in the hope that has been established through the steadfast obedience of Christ their Lord. Give them grace to triumph through their sufferings and rise to serve you even in the presence of those who trouble them. Bless, we beseech you all missionaries of the gospel, our sister congregations in the North American Lutheran Church. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Let the radiance of our beautiful Savior fill the hearts and sanctify the ministries of this congregation. Make our worship into a joyful duty and our service into a sacrifice of praise. Use us to lead others to Jesus that with us they may worship, honor, bless, and adore him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You have appointed your Son as King of creation and Lord of the nations. Teach our leaders to praise your name, to love justice and righteousness, and to seek those things that make for peace. Come to the help of those whose lives are troubled by sorrow and hardship, and draw all people into the glorious and gentle rule of Christ their Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift our hearts to you on behalf of all whose lives are clouded by any sort of affliction or sorrow. Let the light of Jesus' countenance heal and cheer them. Let them all who care for them do so with tenderness and compassion. And grant that together we may praise you for your unending mercies. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our beautiful Savior, those who have died trusting in your promises now see you face to face. We thank you for bestowing this blessing upon them. Continue, we pray, to show us your amazing love. And though we are your unworthy servants, bless us with those good gifts that will sustain us and others in this life bringing us and your good times into that endless life and light you share with all whom you have redeemed and give us voices there to sing unceasingly glory and honor praise adoration now and forever be thine lord in your mercies hear our prayer in your hands O lord we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through your son jesus christ our lord Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share Christ's own peace one with another. Peace, young man.
Peace.
says, Offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and ever-living God. You have revealed your glory as the glory also of your Son and of the Holy Spirit, three persons equal in majesty, undivided by splendor, yet one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your everlasting glory. And so over the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Trust in the Lord. 